Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the Monday, November 29th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. And uh, pursuant of the act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, this meeting is being held using remote participation uh, and it is being recorded. So everybody knows. Um, and we always begin the meeting with public comment. Um, if there are members of the public present and it doesn't look like there are that have anything they would like to say um, that is in regard to anything that is not already on the agenda, please do so now. It doesn't look like we have any. And Harvey's just joined us. Mm. Um, okay, so we will move on. I just wanted to um, report on a couple of items that you may or may not know about. Hi, Harvey, thanks for joining us. Um, the first of all, is, as you recall, uh, we reviewed an application to the Community Preservation Act program for the canal study that's being done um, and just some of you may know or may not that um, PVPC, the Regional Planning Commission has issued an RFP for a consultant to do that study. So that is underway and um, very exciting. I'm hoping that we'll be able to get updates on it as they get someone hired and they move along with the project. Um, second of all, I think we mentioned this at a previous meeting or meetings, um, the Mass Historical Commission, um, their local um, program representative, a woman named Jennifer Doherty, uh, has been conducting some preservation workshops, which are free and open to the public. And they're especially uh, geared towards historical commission members throughout the state. So if any of you um, are interested in those, and Sarah can probably provide the link to that. And I think you said, you, Sarah, you were attending one this week or maybe last week. I did. They were they were actually all full when I signed up to be on the waiting list for a few of them and got selected to a blank spot for someone who couldn't attend. And I find them to be really useful and engaging. Okay, so that's just something to, not that anyone has any free time, but in case you do and you'd like to learn a little bit more about being a commissioner, that's a great way to do it. Um, thirdly, uh, those of you who stroll through Bay State uh, may have noticed that the house on Warner that we um, put a demolition delay on has come down. So that project is moving forward. Um, and then finally, just a report from the Community Preservation Committee. Um, we finished our review of applications for the fall. And there are two projects that are being funded through the historic preservation set aside for that program. Um, one is the conservation treatment of the sign collection at Historic Northampton. I think you remember seeing a presentation about that from Historic Northampton. And the second is the Michelson Gallery that I uh, brought to you um, to have some discussion about. I needed your help on that one, which and your help was great. Um, we really had a very, very lengthy discussion about this as um, a committee a lot of different points of view about it. And what we ended up doing was offering partial funding to them um, with the caveat that we would be placing a preservation restriction on the building that this commission will hold. Um, so we will need to review any major changes to the exterior of the building and interior too, correct, Sarah? I think it's, is it mostly exterior or is it interior? Mostly, mostly exterior. exterior. Um, and I think that the decision that was made was based on the fact that um, this was a historic building, very important to the fabric of the downtown. And it was worth saving just to keep the downtown intact and also um, provide you know, uh, continuity to the historic streetscape. But because it was privately owned, um, there the committee was very, concerned about not placing any restrictions on it. So we were able to give it some money. And Sarah, have you heard from Michelson about whether they're accepting the terms or not? 
I haven't, no. Um, and it also needs to be approved by city council. So That's true. Go before them for first reading this coming Thursday. Okay, thank you. Yes, it is, none of these have been approved yet by city council. But um, And then there are a whole slew of other applications that we approved. Um, that we didn't deny any of them, but they were mostly all good. And you're welcome to go on the city website and look at those um, through this community preservation committee link. So, so if anybody just has any questions about that, I'll happy to answer Sarah as well. Um, and if not, we will move on. I have a um, question. Oh, yeah, please. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, I was just wondering if the commission um, administers or manages other preservation restrictions. Is that something that this commission does? It is. And Sarah, do you, I mean, we have one on Historic Northampton, the Clark School. Well, it's not the Clark School anymore, but um, what else? Um, uh, the Historic Courthouse on Main Street. Um, the Academy? Uh, no, that one is held by NASA Historic because that's actually a city owned building. Uh, there's a few temporary restrictions like the one at the um, that schoolhouse on Hatfield Street. That the commission reviewed some work at right. a few years ago, and and there's a, um, a temporary restriction also at the former Florence Grammar School. And what about Smith Charities? Uh, that one's also held by Mass oh, Historic. Mass Historic that's right, because they wanted that. Okay, so yeah, we have a few. Yeah, that brings up another question: Are we by holding those um, preservation restrictions? Are we supposed to do an inspection either yearly or? at least periodically or not? Or do we just review something when it comes up? Because historic Northampton, we've run into the issue that we really have not, you know, with the uh, Clap Pollard house on, uh, what is that near Dewey Court? We um, hadn't really been good about that over the years. And we just did a, uh, basically a conditions report, a very detailed conditions report and spent hours there taking pictures and, we're developing a narrative. And I just wonder if the Historical Commission is supposed to do that for the properties that we hold restrictions for. Uh, there, it's not specifically required and there's no affirmative mm -hmm. responsibility for the holder um, of the restriction. It, the ones that the commission holds are generally pretty publicly visible buildings that are right. by nonprofits. So they're, um, they're, there's a higher level of visibility there, but it, right. it's good to check on them, certainly. Right. Right. I mean, it might be a good thing to even say, you know, once a year we check in just to see if anything's happened or if sure. we want to make every 18 months or just something we, we could consider putting in our agenda or yeah. having um, an inspection of some sort just to, just because of this thing that came up with Historic Northampton, it occurred to me that really we should think about it for the ones we have. But the other question I had was, um, I can't remember how much money uh, Michelson galleries had been asking for, and you said partial. They were right. partial funding. Were they given half? Or what was the proportion that they were offered? Okay, so this is how we explain. We we came up with the money. We gave them roughly eighty thousand, right, Sarah? I read about that, and they had asked for like one eighty, something like that. Hmm. And what had happened was, um, in our deliberations with them, uh, you know, one of our meetings, a question and answer period, it kind of slipped out that they, we asked them what would happen if we didn't fund them. And they said they would either have to sell the building or they would remove um, the front facing gable, basically the um, triangular piece on the top of the building that faces, which is they believe what is failing. That's their opinion, that that's what is failing and causing problems. Um, and I think they were pushed a little harder about that, that they would remove um, and that they had been given a price of $100,000 to remove it and that they, they could cover that. Um, and so when we um, went to you know, calculate the award, we based our decision on that. Okay, well, if they really do have $100,000 um, to spend on this, we'll give them the rest, the 80,000. And that's what we did. Um, you know, <sighs> Their application and um, their presentation was a little vague. There were some inconsistencies in it, and the commission or the committee members, you know, certainly brought all of those um, inconsistencies up. Um, there was a lot of discussion about how this, you know, funding a privately owned 
enterprise like this um, was like other funding we had given to historic buildings um, and how it was different. And, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about um, how this gets differentiated. And I think there was a very strong feeling, again, that it's, it's, a, it's a very important piece of the downtown. It's a very important historic building. But yet, you know, we are not in a position as a committee um, to act like a bank, basically. So um, this was our way of kind of compromising to say, yes, we support the preservation of this building, but we can't um, set a precedent for just financing, fully financing, um, you know, his privately owned historic buildings for pro that are for profit businesses. And oh, the other thing, the other caveat or restriction on it, and I'm right about this, Sarah, is that um, if the building was sold within five years, they would have to pay the money back. Yeah. I mean, it was a it, it was an issue, I think, for a number of us because they own this building outright. There are no liens on it. And the assessment is oh, you know, $1.3 million or more. So we couldn't understand why they just weren't going to a bank for the, you know, taking on an equity loan or a second mortgage, you know, a mortgage to pay for it because the mortgage interest rates are so low right now. Um, and they just said they didn't want to do that. So any further questions about it? Okay. Uh, Martha, I'll just add to one of those items, the uh, historic Northampton work that's beginning. Um, Lori Sanders had asked me to share with the commission that the, the work at the Shepherd Barn is beginning. So they're starting oh, to do the in interior. Wow. Um, and we'll now be beginning the, the sign and larger it, artifact restoration. It's really amazing what it looks like with some of the space opened up because some of it will be removed, some of it'll be preserved, some, you know, they're different decisions that are being made even as we look at the um, timbers once they're really exposed more. But it's it's really quite, it's really exciting to see it happening. That the barn will get used again. That's great. That's great. Is there an anticipated completion date for that? You know, I can't remember what the schedule is. Yeah. Um, uh, I think maybe we think it might open next fall. Oh, wow. I think it could be that soon. Yeah. Or even the summer. I'm pretty sure you know, a lot of the work was going to proceed over the winter. Great. Well, at some point, it'd be great, maybe when they're a little further along, to have Sarah and um, and or Betty come back in and give us an update. That'd be wonderful. Okay. Any other, any other questions or anything else before we move on? Okay. Um, we do have a set of minutes to approve. These are from June 28th, <clears throat> the beginning of our discussion about the Michelson Gallery application, among other things. Um, do, can I entertain a motion to approve these? I'm moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I'm sorry, I just noticed my name was spelled wrong at the beginning of the Shepherd Bar. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. That was it. Okay. Uh, so we do need a roll call. So Craig? Yes. Steve? I think I have to abstain because I wasn't on the commission at that point. All uh, right. We were uh, talking Barbara? about in them. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We said nice things. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Harvey? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, fantastic. All right, uh, our next item is the public hearing to um, review the property at Seven College Lane, which is, uh, there's been a request to demolish this building. And um, so this is um, per the demolition review ordinance, chapter 161 of the general code. And just to remind everyone, um, this is typically a two-part process. So we have one meeting to meet uh, to decide whether we think this building is historically significant. 
And if so, then we move our discussion about um, whether any kind of delay is placed on it. Um, in other words, whether it is preferably preserved to the next meeting. Um, in this case, there was a staff decision made about the first step um, that there was some certainty that we would determine this building to be prefer preferably preserved. And so we are moving past the first step onto the second step at this meeting. Um, and as all of you know, because um, we've been through this before, some other properties, um, this ordinance uh, and our charge in executing it is to um, decide whether it would be in the public interest for the structure to be, be preserved rather than demolished. And as Sarah so um, accurately put in her staff report, there are a number of um, pieces of evidence that we need to review in order to make that determination. Um, I can go through these all with you if that's helpful. Um, if you have not had a chance to read this or if you have, uh, we can just um, have a presentation from Charlie who, Cronin, who is here representing Smith College, I believe. Um, and Charlie, I guess I would say, do you, if you have an opportunity to speak, this would be the time to do it. Hello. Hi. Hi. Am I there? Um, yeah, I don't really have a lot to say. I think it's pretty much laid out in the um, in the in the request for uh, zoning on that application we still in. So, if there's questions for me, I'd be happy to take them. Does anybody have any questions for Charlie about this? Well, I, I guess after we talk to, to, to you, Charlie, we'll have a discussion of our own, but I'm just, it, this, considering the, what we feel, what I feel is really great historical significance of this building for various reasons. I'm puzzled and that Smith went to the, well, went to the trouble, what, a hundred years ago to move it when they were gonna mm -hmm. build John M. Green, <clears throat> when, when they're gonna build John M. Green Hall and then to renovate it in part because of its really beautiful location, renovated what 20, almost 20 years ago as the office of admission. I'm, I'm puzzled by Smith now wanting to demolish this building. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's limited in its capacity to fulfill the need that the college is envisioning for that site. So do they want something bigger there? Um, or? Just, it's not going to be much bigger. Different, or just different. <laughs> I think different. Okay. Yeah, and just to remind everyone, we are not- um, I know we're not concerned with what's yeah. going to replace we, we it. Not, I'm just trying to figure yeah. out why the college feels the need to demolish such an historic building. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I will just remind everybody, um, the evidence that we need to consider in order to make a determination. Um, first of all, the condition of the building or structure. Um, is it intact? What's the age of it? <clears throat> is it the building a, a exemplary representation of a certain style or period? And if so, how many of those exist? The building's role in the streetscape? Any construction elements that embody distinctive characteristics of a period? Does the building or structure yield information important to history? Has the building or structure been designed by a famous and or local architect? <clears throat> and has the building or structure been, been removed from its original location? And if so, does it still have architectural value? And I just wanted to also, I don't know, uh, you have all have seen this, but Steve um, Steimer um, produced a letter that was submitted. I think we got this today from Sarah um, that talks a little bit about the building's history and its uh, significance in the Underground Railroad movement here in Northampton. So if any of you haven't seen that, um, I would encourage you to take a look at it because it's quite um, detailed. Okay, any discussion on the part of the commission? 
Questions for Charlie? And Steve, you can you can certainly engage in the discussion. You just cannot vote. This is only to talk about should it be preserved, not to talk about an alternative instead of demolition. We cannot talk about alternatives or what or judge design. And just to be clear, this is not within the local historic district. If it were within the district, um, we would be asked to review any plans for what's going in there as part of our charge, because it would be a new building within the district, but it is not within the district. It's visible, but it's not within. No questions, no discussion. Um, our, our well, well, I certainly want to make some points about what I feel are the. And please, is that what you want to do now? That it's not yeah. a specific question for Charlie. Yeah, yeah I, I, I have, well, a, a bit to say. Um, sure. First, um, and I do note that Steve, what Steve Strymer said was because I don't know if people have looked at that the form B, which is, I think may have said the updated form B, may have said that Moses Breck. Um, uh, actually built the house, but it seems that he owned the lot where John and Green Hall now is, sold it to, um, uh, um, is it Gertrude Stoddard? I apologize, I can't remember her name. Um, and that presumably she built a building on the lot at 70 Elm Street around 1861. And that presumably that was designed by William Fenno Pratt who is clearly the, you know, the most significant, or at least one of the most significant local architects that, that we have in Northampton. And it would pain me a great deal to think that we were gonna lose a building of his design. Um, uh, that's, that's one thing. And also it's been where it is. So it's sort of historically important where it is since 1909 when it was moved. Um, cited over the uh, over Paradise Pond. It was the gardener's house by 1915 um, and some other botanic garden. It, so it has connection to the Lyman plant house. And um, I'm trying to think it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty standard uh, Pratt design. You know, he, he, he uses this really simple Gothic revival things with pediments and gables. So it's not, unusual for him. Uh, there are some other buildings in Northampton like it, but again, I think we have a limited number of Pratt buildings extant and we need to preserve them. Um, well, what else I can see, you know, Smith, you know, itself acknowledges all this in, uh, uh, there were some uh, documents you were given, but <clears throat> in, in a book that actually I happened to design, um, this is the house we live in, which talks about all the buildings at Smith. It talks about the significance of that building and Smith's own campus guide that was published. Wait a minute, I'm looking at my copy here. Published in 1997, I think it is. Oh, no, sorry, 2007. And again, talks about the connection to, you know, certainly that it was designed by, by William Fenno Pratt in 1861. So I just feel it is preferably preserved and I would hope the college could figure out a way to, you know, it's fine with me if if you were to demolish, say, the addition you put on in hmm. that 1993 or something, you know, if you want to take that away and just work again with the 1861 building and then add on to that again in a different way, but to use, incorporate that, um, the original building, which seems pretty intact to me. And I'm assuming that since I know Smith takes good care of its buildings, that it presumably it's in good condition. Thanks, Barbara. I, I wanted to just note the closing paragraph in the guide that you mentioned, Barbara, that you were involved in writing and how um, the house introduced visitors to the warm domesticity that is so much a part of life at Smith. I thought that was interesting. Okay. Um, anybody else have any other comments about this? Craig? Well, I was just wondering what the budget is to demo this property. Oh, specifically for the demolition of the building? I, I don't know. I mean, I've demo, 
I've taken down similar size buildings in the range of fifty to sixty thousand dollars, probably. Okay. Okay. That's useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dylan. Well, I would I would agree with everything Barbara said. I think we have a wealth of information about this. The connections to Breck and Pratt, who both could have certainly worked, they worked together on buildings in other cases, um, are are really significant. They're important figures um, in Northampton building and with Breck and Northampton's abolitionist history. Um, it's it's so much a part of the streetscape for me there, and it's new home where it's been for you know since 1909 um so i think that that's important too um yeah i i strongly feel that this should be properly preserved for the information we have harvey any thoughts nothing different i mean i i agree with everything that's been said okay and steve do you want to weigh in even though you can't vote Uh, no, I'm just going to listen in today. Okay. All right. And, and it, it does concern me that I know this has happened in the past, not, not just with Smith buildings, but with, with other buildings in town owned by other people that, you know, the demolition review, which, and if it, if something's preferably preserved, um, we can delay demolition for up to 12 months, but a lot of times people just wait that out. And then the building after 12 months, the building gets taken down so that if we were to find this preferably preserved, I would really hope, Charlie, that we could, you know, have discussions or talk or try and do something to um, to find a solution to to re to retain that the older part of the building. I, I can certainly pass along your comments, Barbara. OK, thanks. Yeah, I would just echo what Barbara says. Oh, Barbara, you, I'm doing to speak over you. Would you like, do you have more that you'd like to say? No, no, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Um, I would just like to echo what Barbara said. I, I would, um, you know, I know we've asked this of Smith in the past, you know, whether there um, is an alternative to completely demolishing this, um, you know, to find another owner, to move it. Um, and then if it, if demolition is the only option, um, I certainly would like to see the building fully documented, photographed, and so that there is a record of it um, kept both at the library and historic Northampton, because it is a significant work of our major architect in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things. But here tonight, we're decide we're trying to decide about uh, placing a delay on this. Of, uh, we have up to twelve months to do that, and if in the meantime Smith were able to find another buyer to move it, um, then we could possibly lift the delay. So I would be happy to entertain a motion, unless anybody has any other, and we can have further discussion after a motion is made. I have a little question. One more question, sure, Craig. Sure. This was um, this came to our attention quickly last June. We didn't really have much discussion about it. When was the exact time out of this? If we were to go for a twelve demolition delay, July first delay, or does it start from last June? It's July first. That's when the application. I think or the seventh, July first or seventh. Yeah, July first. We're looking at July 1st, 2022, effectively a six month demolition. Right. That's all we can do. Okay. I would, I would move that we do that. Did we place a, can we can, I guess we can put a 12 months delay. It has to be six months. Um, or be, yeah, be seven months actually. It would be well, one we, year from the, the date. We could, the yeah, we could phrase it. Okay. It's one year from the date. Yeah. You know. right. So so we are attempting a year delay. Yes. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Second then. Okay. Any more discussion? Are we going to have a chance tonight to discuss an alternative plan? 
So well done after we vote on this right now. What do you mean by an alternative plan, Craig? I'll have a back a back of the little notebook plan on how to save this building that I'd like to discuss. A back of a notebook plan to to save this building from demolition. Okay. Well, why don't you offer your thoughts? Okay. Here's what we'll do. If it's going to cost $50,000 to demo the building, why not assign $50,000 to a fund to uh, preserve the building by bringing in a competent realtor? The last time there was not such a person who brought in to save a building on the campus that failed in the end. And it was kind of like predestined. Those in the real estate world knew it was predestined to fail. I will give you a list of six realtors to choose from, and they will get $12,500 of the 50 once the property closes. $12,500 $12, would go to marketing worldwide about this project and the opportunity. We will find a lot for it to go to and find a buyer. That buyer will then get another $25,000 to make up the total 50. The buyer would get the discount that would go to help create their needs to move and put it on a new location. So what you would spend next July to demo it, we could start within the next couple of weeks with a bona fide plan that would create a website and we would like Smith College to advertise it to all the alums. I'm sure that there's a lot of positive memories of all the Smith alums. They would love to be able to move back to Northampton or one of their friends and take control of this project. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, I think that, thank you for your ideas. I think that um, Charlie's heard them and I believe that's something that, you know, an activity that would happen at, have to happen outside this commission. Um, tonight, we need to vote on the demolition delay and we've already had a motion in a second. Um, and unless there's other further discussion, we should take a vote. All right, um, so roll call necessary. So Craig. Uh, Steve. He's not voting. He couldn't, he couldn't vote. Outstanding. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Harvey? Yes. So Charlie, if there are any alternatives that you come up with between now and next July, you know, we should be willing to entertain those. Okay, I could, the best I can do is pass that along to the administration for their consideration. And, um, thanks everyone for their time tonight. Appreciate it. Very Thank nice. you. All right. Good night, all. Good night. Bye bye. Okay. Um, we also have on the agenda a review of the historic district guidelines. And um, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at those. I did look at them today, and I do have a so. Sarah explained, I think at the last meeting and also in her staff report, um, that the guidelines were never approved by the city council when they were developed, which is amazing to me. Um, and so they do need to be, they need to be approved um, to make them part of our ordinance for the local historic district. This is the time to make any updates or edits um, for the council to review and include. Um, Sarah has provided a roof and ground solar section, and I don't know if anybody else has been able to look at them. Um, I have a couple of things that I noted. I think we need to make sure are included. Can I just um, ask, was this sent to us before this meeting or had it been sent to us before? Um, it was mentioned at the last meeting that we were right, right. reviewing them. Mm, um, I apologize. I think I did not do that. Is it possible to have them up on the screen as the we're guidelines? talking about them? Yeah, I mean, what, what were the parts that we're talking about 
while we're discussing them? Would that be possible? Uh, so I didn't have anything specific. This was oh, just sort oh. of a, a bigger homework assignment to look at the guidelines oh, and see if I there's see. anything oh. that jumped out to anyone that needed updating okay. or revising right. I apologize. before we take it to city council. And I do also, I, I haven't yet, but I do need to send everyone the um, proposed revised section. I'm sorry. You said you haven't sent us the solar. I have not. Like the, okay, all right, so fine. I feel better I didn't miss that, okay. Do people have um, any thoughts about it? I, I know I have a few. I'm happy to put those forward. Um, I have a, a question. What is the timeline in terms of any revisions? Uh, as soon as possible, but you know, it's been 10 years since these accidentally were not approved by council. Um, yeah, but if, you know, if the commission were to deny uh, someone's application based on the guidelines that could potentially pose a problem. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so, but we also, you know, we've, we've missed this city council um, and they'll have an organizational meeting in January. So hoping for some time in early winter. So it's a new council that's coming in. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I had a few things that I think we should look at. I was mostly look at this, looking at this um, in light of the city's sustainability plan. And I think that when these were written, um, and I have to take some responsibility because I was involved, um, we weren't thinking so much about environmental impacts and climate change. So um, just a few things that came to mind. Um, there's some languages, language about materials for fences, gutters and downspouts, and vinyl is discouraged. And I think we should prohibit that. I think it's a, it's a petroleum product. Um, you know, plastic is clogging our oceans. And I just don't think it's a material that we as a commission, as a city should support the use of. Um, people often use it because they think it's cheaper and it will last forever, but it, it doesn't. And um, it's, you know, very toxic. So I wouldn't, I just, that would be one. I, those two I would look at. Um, Sarah, you're looking at the solar panel dimensions on the roof. Remember that came up with the Elm Street property and how they seem kind of arbitrary that, you know, the amount of Eve that could be shown so hopefully that can be more flexible. And also I think providing, and I don't know how we do this in the guidelines, but we need to provide for new innovations in solar because I know that's changing. Remember the discussion um, about, I think that Craig was in on this, about um, new technologies that are being in, used in Europe for solar panels that are um, resemble shingles um, and those could be, you know, five years, I don't know, five years from now. So we want to be able to make sure that we can accommodate those new technologies. Um, so that um, the landscaping section made reference to preference for native materials. And this has become an issue in the field in the sense that a lot of native plantings that um, we think of as, you know, being here in the 19th century or 18th century and earlier, are really not surviving today with the effects of climate change. So a lot of our native species are under threat. Um, the hemlocks are a big one, sugar maples are another, beaches, ashes. Um, and so I think we have to be careful about using that language and that what we want to try to do is encourage the use of plant materials, for example, that will withstand the um, impacts of warming temperatures and more storms. Um, so basically trees that, trees, for example, that do well in urban conditions, um, you know, soil, heat, um, compaction, wet feet, all of the above, salt. Mm, those are the ones that I had. Um, and again, I was really looking at it from a sustainability point of view. Um, I think, Excuse me. I think there was an issue when we um, looked at someone on Elm Street who had put in, 
I guess what they were calling a parking pad in front of the <laughs> house. Yep. And what the question is, was it really like a turnaround in the driveway? And I think we wanted to address the language in that section. And I don't have it in front of me, so I don't know what the changes would be, but I, I think it's a it's a, a section that we would need to look at because I know we were kind of limited or or it was certainly ambiguous. And I think we could try and define that better. Uh, we, 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 yeah, we may have addressed that already. Did we already? The ordinance itself, uh, paving had been completely exempt from historic district oh, review. Okay. And we, we changed that actually immediately following that particular review. Oh, okay. So that was it raised. So that only paving within an existing driveway layout. Would be exempt. So I, I don't know if that addresses you. Okay. It, just something maybe we should look at one more time to make sure the language is the way we'd want it. But I had forgotten that we had made that change. Anybody else have any thoughts? Or do, you know, you'll have a little more time to look at these in the next month or so. Um, I have a um, few comments just based on our recent um, two applications applications and applying the design guideline cases. I think um, there's uh, two things that came up in the um, commission's deliberations that might be useful to um, include in the plan. Can you hear me? I'm getting a message that says internet connection unstable. Okay. Um, yeah. One is about, okay, one is about restoration versus rehabilitation. So one of the applicants um, um, might be useful to uh, reference a document like the Secretary of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, where those two terms are defined. I don't know if they're in the glossary. I don't know the document inside and out, so I don't know if they're in the glossary or not. Yeah. But um, you know, sometimes commission members will use specific terminology, but applicant using it, and it seems like a sort of a big picture thing that could be helpful. Um, I also found that there's a lot of specifics about different architectural features, but um, not as much uh, sort of like, you know, the Secretary of Interior Standards has 10 statements of principle. So it's like, you know, retain and repair as a philosophical approach. Um, so maybe it's just a one sentence thing that says, you know, the the, uh, 10 principles that guide uh, our thinking are, are the Secretary of Interior for the treatment of historic properties, and it identifies these four treatment approaches, which are reconstruction, preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration. That would be a two-sentence way to deal with it. Um, and then just looking at it with outside eyes and having looked at a lot of these before, I have some other revisions, but I think they might have to wait for the preservation plan because I don't think they're one month changes. Um, and I'll mention them briefly now, but I don't think we can do these in a month. I, I think for the future, it would be useful to list contributing and non-contributing properties for the district. Um, there's a map, I think, that's a little hard to read it, but that language is not used. And, and I think that uh, we should have that. We should be clear about which ones are contributing and which ones are non-contributing. Um, and then also, I'm looking at the, I've looked at the document a few different times and uh, I don't know if is there is there a history that goes with the design guidelines. There's um, a brief history of the district in the beginning. Okay, but the district has been expanded since that point. And yes, that's a good point. So I think again, I think this is a longer term mm -hmm. project, but I think there's a different kind of historic context that might be needed. So anyway, I can write the I can write a sample of what those two sentences would look like, but then for the longer term, I'd be interested in both those things, the contributors and non-contributors, and something about history. And um, I think there's a landscape history, for instance, where we, we could write, um, even if it's just a page, about what that landscape history is or what Elm Street means in a New England town uh, that would be valuable for context. Yeah, and Steve, in terms of the landscape, I think. Um especially with the addition of the Clark School property um, that was made a few years ago. Um, I think the whole, um, 
the whole character of the district changed in the sense because the boundary expanded. And so instead of this sort of meandering main street, we now have this very historic, you know, hill in the middle of it um, that has a whole history in and of itself and a pretty important one to the history of the city. So that I agree that that should absolutely be added. So yeah, and I think I mean you could say something, for instance, about this connection between topography and certain kinds of sites within town and 19th century philanthropic initiatives like founding a women's college or a school for the deaf, right? You know, right. not 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 just only philanthropic, but educational oriented yes. philanthropic institutions. And that's connected to the landform in ways that are important to note. So again, that I think that's a year or two, you know project but there's some of those things which just seem like they need to be in there be, especially if people are reading the document or looking referring to it as the sort of go-to source about the single designated local historic district in the city yeah, yes I, and, I, I think ahead, we Barbara. could borrow from the um uh, elm street expansion mm -hmm. historic district report yep. um just because we we don't have any of that new information about round hill so that, I think that's that, yeah, that that's would be helpful question. to provide some additional context. Yeah. And also too, just in light of what Steve Strymer uh, had produced for the admissions building, um, there is a connection to the abolitionist movement, we you know within the district itself. Um, it may not be the whole district, but there's a thread and that would be important to include as well, especially given the work that's being done up in Florence on the National Register District up there. So Okay, any other thoughts about that? So we'll come back to this um, at our next meeting, which is scheduled for right after the holiday. Um, and I don't know whether, do, are we, do we wanna meet on the 27th? Is that a bad time to schedule a meeting or to have a meeting scheduled? How do people feel about that? December 27th. I anticipate being out of town. It's not impossible that I could come in, but it, that would be hard for me. Okay, what about others? I may be out of town also, I'm not okay. sure. Um, let's see, I mean, we could, can, Sarah, could we schedule it for the week before? Is that out of the question? Yeah, no, that would be fine. Which is if the that 20th. Works better for everyone. That might be better for everybody, the 20th. Um, I'm having surgery later in the month, so I definitely can't do the 20th and I may not be able to do the 27th. Okay. Both work for me. Okay. 20th works for me. Okay, and Harvey? You're muted. Sorry, the 20th is possible for me. It's a super busy time for me. Yeah, I can I'm imagine. A physical priest, so you head to Christmas. Okay. That's a, but it's not not impossible. Okay. And how about you, Dylan? Oh, I'm working week to week, so I have no idea what those days are. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we shoot for the twenty? It seems like more of us can make it then, and hopefully, Jonathan will be able to um, do it as well. Um, okay. We have a couple more things on the uh, items on the agenda. Um, Could I ask you just one quick thing? This is, yes. I know this is pitiful and I should be an adult about this, but Sarah, when um, when you send the invitation, if you could put in there a thing saying, by the way, check this, these guidelines, here's the link, that would help me to remember to do that. Uh, if we're going to yes. have this on the agenda again. I, I can do that. I'll put a note in my calendar as well, but that would, that would be a good reinforcement for me at least. It, it would have helped me too. <laughs> but I... I should have, I knew we had been asked to do it for the last meeting, but again, it had slipped my mind. That's fine. And um, I, I've been busy as well, so I didn't, I haven't had time to finalize the, the solar piece of it. So, so it's all right if it carries on for a few minutes, that's not an issue. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is nominating a Community Preservation Committee representative. Um, my term expired sometime recently, and um, I'm still continuing to serve until we have nominated and um, 
voted on another representative. Uh, if there's anybody who would like to do this, to step in, you're welcome to take over for me. Um, I'm also happy to continue, at least in the interim, or I shouldn't say that. I'm happy to continue. Anybody interested? <laughs> it's a fascinating group, and we have a fantastic chair who keeps the, build, the meetings on track, um, which are not always easy to keep on track. <laughs> It's a big, you know, nine, there are nine of us on the committee, so it's a big group of people. Um, but everyone comes from a different place, and um, really, it's a very interesting uh, assignment. I've learned a lot being on it. Anybody? Well, unless somebody else jumps forward, I'd be very happy with you, Martha, continuing, because you've been doing a really great job. And if you are really willing to do it, and nobody else feels they can, then that might be a solution for us. Thank you, Barbara. Anybody? Um, I will say that it's gonna be a big help, I think, to the CPC um, and to me as a representative to it from this committee um, to have our preservation plan um, because it's been hard to, you know, we, we, these historic preservation applicants come to this committee, this commission to kind of get our endorsement um, and then they go forward if we endorse them. Um, but there's been no really methodical, strategic way of understanding what we should be funding, what we shouldn't. Um, we're just sort of reacting. And so I think the plan, that's one thing we need to think about when we do the preservation plan is, um, you know, keeping in mind CPC and other funding avenues that are out there um, and how we can support, um, possibly foster, you know, applications to them. Uh, so that's, that, that would be, it would be a helpful thing to have, that's all I'm saying. But um, I'm happy to continue. It's a three year appointment. And at that point, you know, we can decide who wants to step forward. But um, so unless anybody has any, other thoughts, um, I, I need a motion on that. And we have to vote. I would move to have Martha Lyon serve another term on the CPC as uh, the uh, Historic Commission's representative. I second. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Do you feel like you're getting enough information from me about what's going on in that committee? Oh yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else I could provide for you? Um, I know. I think we. I. I, I don't think the um, the commission's role, or I should say, presence um, on that committee, has been very strong in the past, and I've been trying to you know, elevate that. And that, again, that's why the preservation plan I think is important. Um, but I, I would like to be, you know, feel free to be able to come back to you as I did with the Michelson Gallery and discuss these applications with you uh, just to kind of get your support or your advice or your consensus, I guess. That, that's very helpful to me. Um, so, okay, if there's no more discussion, we will vote. All right, uh, Craig. Steve? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Harvey? Enthusiastically, yes. Thank you, Martha. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, and then the final item uh, is the Central Business Architecture Committee nominee. Um, we, that slot is still open. As you know, um, this is not a position that needs to be filled by a commission member. It could be someone in the community that we felt would be um, an objective, uh, impartial participant in the process. Um, and if anybody has any wishes to be on that, please say. And if not, if you have any um ideas of others in the community who you think would be a good representative um, for us that would be great to put those forward 
No thoughts. Nobody wants to do it. <laughs> and Barbara, I know you've said you've had a conflict. I already feel like so. I can't do it because <laughs> Joe is my husband's on it. Yeah. Yeah. Not something anybody wants to do. This isn't a committee that meets that much. <laughs> Uh, I know they they have sometimes controversial applications that they have to review, but um, okay. Well, I think um, Sarah, this position has been open for a while, and I think it, we need to do something about this. I would like to see us try to um, get this position filled sometime. So, if people could, in the next month or two. Just think about that a little bit more. Maybe Sarah put that in the meeting notification to remind people. Sure. Um, and there is a chance that when the new mayor is inaugurated that that she may choose to put someone forward if there isn't anyone that the historic commission has available, which is fine. I, that's, that's not an issue that does happen sometimes. I mean, we're just filling this AIA nominate, nominee spot on the historic commission since Bruce left after how many years? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And that's Steve. Strymer, I don't know Steve Strymer, but he certainly, his letter was quite impressive. Would he be interested in doing something like this? I just talked to him today. He is not interested in it. He's getting overwhelmed and he needs to downsize. He's a busy guy. Yeah, he is. He's very much in demand. Um, I think we should, you know, give it some thought. You know, people, um, in the architecture world, in the design world, um, you know, people who you think could represent the interests of the historical commission, but it has to be an impartial voice. It can't be someone who favors, you know, uh, or is in um, league with um, applicants. It has to be someone who's impartial. So that's an important thing to consider. Okay, well, we will, we will put that on for the next meeting on the 20th. And then if, um, if nothing comes to pass then, and the mayor has not, the new mayor has not put forth um, a nominee, then we'll continue it in January. Okay, all right. Any other business not foreseen when the agenda was prepared? Okay. We are at the end of the agenda, and I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. Steve, I hope that you're not laid up for a while. Thanks. I uh, I am concerned about what, you know, with, with what Craig brought up. Is there anything else we could do in the interim? And I know you said we can't really do it as a commission, but could we follow up and see if Smith is willing to let somebody help whether it's Craig individually or somebody else to to really try and see if they can find another use or somebody who might want to move that building uh, I can note that in the notification to the the building department and the applicant regarding the demolition delay okay. um, the, the commission is a little bit tied uh, as far as requiring demolition right right no I understand that um, uh, really Smith College was very cooperative with one of their past demos where moving a building was considered. I think the commission ended up um, lifting the delay after about eight or nine months in that case, mm -hmm. because an alternate solution couldn't be found, but the college didn't really make an effort to market. Yeah, they did. It's true. I'll, I'll add in that, that that previous attempt to sell the building was not done correct. And I will, I have lots of friends at Smith College who are professors and alums that um, that they will listen to. If I just make a couple of feelers out there that let's try something in the next six months. I mean, we're only got six months. We can't lose anything really. But you know, let's look at the, let's look at the long term picture here. I always love to make lemonade out of lemons. Fifteen years ago, we had problems where the house on Barrett Place was $100,000 in the early 2000s and torn down, they put a new house in its place that skewed the values of that neighborhood. But at the same time that was happening, we had the house on Old South Street being demoed 
board by board, the house was disassembled and moved to New Hampshire, where the guy who did that job did not mark the boards and timbers correctly and could not reassemble it. Those two collectively made the opportunity for us to have the demo delay ordinance put in. And actually the CPA has a spread that goes back to that as well. I think if we have both the St. John's Cantius Church demoed because of uh, what's called both benign neglect here for the last couple of years, like we saw in Florence. Um, and if we lose this building that has been moved before, I mean, what's missing in Northampton we have a historical commission because every city and town in the state were, were commanded to do so back in the mid 70s. We have a historic society, like historic Northampton, who has their campus and they have their hands full doing good work there. What is missing here is a, a preservation trust similar to what was created or is operating in Springfield. Do that sort of edgier stuff that is not allowed by us or not of interest to the to the local historic society currently. Um, there was one we set up in Holyoke back in the late 90s that had success. I think there needs to be one here. And it, it'll probably come about if we lose both of these buildings, the, the iconic St. John's Cantius and the lesser known Smith College one, but it has been moved previously. Well, why couldn't it be moved again? So if we lose both of those, I think I think a, a preservation group will be formed in North Hampton. And I won't be a part of it because I've got big things doing in the rail trail world. So I'll probably be getting off of here this spring. And, and so I don't want to think I'm going to be leading the fight on preservation in North Hampton. I won't. But I do know that the stars are aligning for that to happen. Those are all really good points, Craig. And I know, I think the Springfield Trust was developed as a result of the casino, right? I'm pretty sure that's- Yes, well, the, no, they, they predate the casino, but the casino- that fueled it. There's always some cataclysmic thing yeah. that causes these sorts of things to come about. Right. You know, you, you probably don't know this, but Holyoke was the fire capital of the country back in the 70s. But most people don't realize there were more municipally sanctioned demolitions in an 18 month window in the 90s. And there were fires the entire decade of the 70s. Mm -hmm. That was where Save Historic Hoyoke was created. And, and now we have the Renaissance coming about. There's been yeah. $125 million of private and public sector reinvestment in the canal district of Hoyoke in the last several years because of the dead railroad linear park conversion in Hoyo. This, this works, gateway cities all over, historic preservation groups get created because of the cataclysmic thing is now. Yeah, and I know that happened with the introduction of the Greenbush line um, to some of the communities on the South shore, especially Hingham. They were able to develop a huge, you know, very, wealthy trust to support preservation efforts mm -hmm. um, for private homeowners who are in the railroad right of way. And that was all because of the, yeah, that was all negotiated as part of that deal. So yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity. That's a great idea. And again, something to be explored through the preservation planning process. So, um, and Sarah, I know you said that you are in the process of putting together an RFP for that. So, um, and we have formed a subcommittee of the three, um, Barbara and Steve and myself. So we'll be involved in that. All right. Any other uh, thoughts before we close tonight and say goodbye for uh, till the end of December? All right. If not, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second by Harvey. All in favor? Thanks. Thanks very Gosh, much. I'm gonna gotta raise my hand here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Have a good nice.